Welcome to this video um, all about Henrik Ibsen's A Doll's House um, for students that are studying political and social protest writing as part of their A-level in English literature. The aim of this video is to equip students with a spider diagram of significant points which often come up time and time again across multiple different essay tasks. Um, so that would be the idea for this um, for this video. So the first thing I want to talk about in terms of adult health is the fact, of course, of the setting. So you have to set this play in a house in order for this play to work. Uh, it's in the title of the play, so we need it. And it's, of course, a middle class home. It's not necessarily lavishly decorated, but it's clearly middle class. Um, and we obviously need to know that the entirety of this play takes place in the front room of the Halmer's home. Um, that means that there's lots of doors, uh, there's lots of barriers to other parts of the house, which Nora often is not allowed into, such as Halmer's um, office. And the whole point of this one room, of course, is it creates a very claustrophobic, oppressive atmosphere in the home. Because as the play develops and the amounts of secrets and paranoia and Nora's kind of catastrophizing increases, the claustrophobia of the house increases as well. So by the time you get to really the end of Act Two, it almost feels untenable. Um, it's so uncomfortable. It's so claustrophobic that it's just not very pleasant at all. So there has already been a question about the significance of the title of the play um, before the pandemic. But you might get a question about the, about the setting. You also might want to obviously refer to the setting as a way of interpreting another essay question as well. And it's if all of this, if all the play takes place in one room, the reason why that is not harmonious is because outside threats invade that room. So Krogstad, for example, comes into the room and sours the whole atmosphere of that home. And that's where you get the semantic field of decay and decomposition and corruption, because it metaphorically represents what Krogstad brings into that room, which detracts from the equilibrium of a, of a happy family home. Um, similar with the setting, of course, you again have this idea of contrasting worlds in political and social protest texts. So the house uh, representing the microcosm in which this marriage is versus the wider society of the macrocosm. In other words, this house is just one house of many who is living in, who is existing in this kind of restrictive um, society. And I think one of the reasons why this play was so uh, controversial at the time that it was released was because you've got that indefinite article A, meaning one of many. So Ibsen was not just writing about one house in this society. He's actually writing about many, many, many homes. And of course, if you're fearful of women doing what Nora does and leaving the home and disrespecting the sanctity of marriage, you're going to want to prevent people from seeing that. So a form of censorship came in, of course, when this play was first written and Ibsen was forced to write an alternative ending where Nora stayed in the home. It's not the, not, not the original, of course. So in this course, we study the original intended version where she, um, where she leaves. Um, so what happens in that home, the dystopia and the marriage inside that home is a reflection of the wider society um, in which that home is situated. And here, for example, we don't have a war, we don't have regime change. The dystopia is the marriage itself. So it's a much more domesticated type of dystopia than perhaps other texts, such as The Kite Runner, for example, or even parts of William Blake's poetry. Um, something else to think about is uh, that this was published in 1875, so it puts it within the Victorian era. And you can also call this play a naturalist prose drama. It's naturalist because the characters are designed to talk uh, to mimic real human speech. The stage directions are quite lengthy as well. It's written obviously in prose, not verse, so it's not written in pentameter like Shakespeare, for example. 
it's written in normal prose, and it's a drama because it's a drama. So if you wanted to give it a more technical label other than play, then you could call it a naturalist prose drama from 1875. And, you know, we know about the Victorian era, for example, very, very respectable, respectability was important, seriousness was important. And one of the ways that you got that was through how society perceives you as a citizen. Uh, we'll talk a bit more about that in a minute in terms of Halmer. Um, again, you might want to use this play to refer to the presentation of women. So the three women in this play, Nora, Mrs. Lind and Anne-Marie, have all had to sacrifice something. Um, so Mrs. Lind, for example, married for money because she had to support um, her young brothers. Anne-Marie, the nurse, had to give up her own child to work to look after Nora. And Nora, of course, has been married for eight years and she believes that it's all been a sham, essentially, um, based on Halma's reaction to the letter in Act 3. And she's not willing to waste any more time being this kind of doll figure. She wants to seek independence and a degree of self-determination. So all women in this play, again, show sacrifice. Worth noting as well that Henrik Ibsen himself said that a woman cannot be herself in modern society. So clearly, this is a feminist text. Um, I've already done a video on this. One of the parts of the end of Act One, which has incredibly heavy irony, uh, in which Halma lectures Nora about how secrecy and lies corrupt the happy atmosphere of the home. Um, of course, he doesn't know that he's basically criticising his own wife because he doesn't know it yet. Um, and he's basically using his role as a former lawyer and now a bank manager to almost seek credibility in what he says. He says that, it, that women are much worse than men at inviting children into lies. It corrupts the children. It's bad parenting. And of course, Nora in her own head is panicking. And after this point, she doesn't see the children anymore. So you've got also in this play the semantic field of corruption and decay, which is to do with this idea of morality and how secrecy and lies uh, mitigate that sense of morality, which, of course, was very important in a Victorian middle class household to have that morality and that respectability. Um, in terms of how other people saw you. And one of the things that Halmer is terrified by is, of course, how other people see him. He wants to dismiss Krogstad from the bank because he doesn't like Krogstad's over-familiarity. He doesn't like how Krogstad calls him by his first name, for example, um, which he feels is an indictment against his status. So for Halmer, part of his masculinity comes from his respectability. Um, so that's a significant section, but I've done a separate video on that about a year ago, I think. Um, as we've said, the text is clearly a feminist text because of its focus on married mothers, uh, obviously represented through Nora and the doll metaphor. Uh, a doll is voiceless, but a doll also wears what you want it to wear. A doll doesn't choose its own clothing. It, it wears the clothing that you want it to wear. So you dress the doll up. Um, Again, I've already done a video about this section of Act 3 where they talk about sacred duties. I, I went through that section of the play quite linguistically, actually, because it's quite important. And all about really debating what is the role of a mother? What is the role of a, of a wife? You know, if you were to give a list of, of duties that a woman has to her husband and children, where on that list does duties to herself focus or feature? And clearly it's going to be down at the bottom at this time. So the question is, does or or did a woman sacrifice her own identity and her own needs for the um, for marriage and for motherhood? So clearly a feminist text. Thinking to that, obviously, one of the central moments of this play is when Nora goes to a fancy dress ball, um, which they have allegedly been rehearsing for ages. Helmer has told all the dance moves. And of course, she hasn't chosen that dress to wear herself. Helmer has told her to wear that dress. So again, she, in the same way that you would dress a doll up to wear a dress, Nora is also being dressed up here. So it's also a symbol of that repression. When she is practising or rehearsing her dance at the end of Act Two, 
she makes out that she has forgotten all of the dance moves. And one of the things that happens is her hair comes down. Um, and again, that could symbolically represent her breaking free from the rigid control, not only of those rules of the dance, but also of the rules of the marriage. It's symbolically showing her transgression into being her own woman. Um, you know, in effect, letting loose her her femininity, I suppose, uh, which prepares us, of course, for her ultimate exit at the end of Act Three. So this idea of dressing something up to decorate it. One of the things that Halma says when they get back from the Sternborgs uh, Tarantella party in Act Three is, doesn't my Nora look beautiful? So she, he almost objectifies her as if she's a doll to be looked at and to be marvelled at. And that's, of course, just going to wind her up even more if she's already got in her head that she's a bit of a doll to begin with. Um, in the beginning of the play, Halma uses lots of zoomorphisms or metaphors in order to um, to label Nora, for example, my songlark, my thrush, whatever. All of these terms have the possessive determiner my, but they're also all the animals are quite cute, um, powerless animals as well. Um, now, on the one hand, you could view that as being quite affectionate. Um, or on the other hand, you could view it as being quite patronising and being controlling. So, again, there's two ways you could interpret that, those zoomorphisms um, in the beginning. Krogstad, who is the play's antagonist, and his name actually translates as crooked, um, is the pose of the question, should the amoral be reformed? Um, so Krogstad, very ironic to Nora, has also committed fraud in the past and he was and he has suffered um, kind of damnation from society as a result of that. And Krogstad has children to feed. And what Krogstad is doing is actually trying to do something quite noble, which is to climb back up the respectability ladder because he has to support his children. There's nothing wrong with that. But then you have people like Dr. Rank and Halmer who almost stand in the way of that. Who, want, who, who believe that bad people should not be reformed because it leaves all the good people out in the cold. So why should somebody who's broken the law get a job if somebody who hasn't broken the law can't get a job? Is that fair, for example? Should people who um, have broken the law get a free laptop to prevent them from reoffending, whereas the people that have not broken the law get nothing? Is that fair? So it's this... Dr. Rank and Halma bring into question this idea of, a, of, of somebody who being able to be reformed. Can somebody go from amoral to moral? Should bad people be given a second chance? And obviously what's ironic about Crosstad and Nora is they've both done the same thing, which is committed fraud and forgery. And yet Crosstad is the one that seems to be blackmailing Nora in this play, of course. Uh, and Krogstad is the catalyst by which, I mean, you could argue that maybe Nora has everything to thank Krogstad for, because but for Krogstad's letter and his threat of telling Halma about the loan, she would still be with Halma now. And it wouldn't have been eight years of a wasted life in this marriage. It would have been, I don't know, 50 years. So maybe Krogstad should be thanked for being the catalyst to, for allowing Nora to leave and getting that um, freedom, perhaps. Um, Halma, as I've already said, was a uh, lawyer, which obviously the legal profession has a very close relationship with respectability, and he's now a bank manager. Both of those roles uh, enhance his sense of masculine pride and his masculine sense of respectability. Halma, husband character, is the powerful elite within this domestic sphere of the play. He is not a king or a leader, he is a husband. And it goes to show that you can still talk about the elite as in the head of the household without really having to talk about prime ministers or presidents or leaders or gods. You know, he is the head of this house. He is in the most powerful position just because he's won the genetic lottery of being male. And that's obviously in part what Nora is resisting against and also what she's rebelling against at the end. You could also argue that Halma becomes the doll at the end of the play because he is the only one left in the house, because she's left by that point. Um, Nora's decision to leave, of course, at the end, is a democratic decision. It's a choice. She hasn't been forced to make that decision. She leaves of her own free will. And Halma allows her to leave. 
And in that sense, you could say that maybe he's actually quite a good husband. Perhaps, you know, he's not chaining her to a radiator. He's not locking her in his office forever. He's allowing her to leave. So again, some of us might feel quite sympathetic towards Halma at the end of the play because he's alone at the end. And you could argue, you know, he hasn't really done anything wrong specifically. He's just doing what society expected him to do. And it's, you know, hindsight is a wonderful thing. It's very easy and convenient to say, well, maybe he should have done better. But if you're living in a society that doesn't give an alternative, you're not going to have that maybe that insight. She leaves to seek independence and self-governance in a democratic way. As we've said, Dr Rank is representative of a victim um, of parental recklessness. Um, so he says basically that because of his father's lifestyle, um, he's having to bear his disability of the spine. And he also is the one, I think, in Act 1 or possibly Act 2, where he talks about Crogs. I think it's Act 2 and talks about Krogstad, um, and should somebody who is of moral disrepute be given a second chance? So he poses that question of morality, and his, I think it's tuberculosis of the spine, is representative of that idea of the disease of society, which he believes Krogstad is. People who are corrupt, being given second chances, is not a good thing, in Dr Rank's eyes, because it leaves good people out in the cold. Gibson has clearly deliberately set this play at Christmas, um, which is also known as the Festival of the Home. And of course, the setting of the play is a home. Uh, you would expect Christmas to be spent by people indoors, in the home, with family. So it has these connotations of togetherness. However, clearly, at the end of the play, um, it shocks us in terms of not only what she does, but she does it at Christmas time as well. So it's it's to reinforce the fact that, um, you know, Christmas is usually about togetherness, but yet she still leaves. You've also got the Christmas tree and very similar to the Tarantella costume, you decorate the Christmas tree to make it look better. So it looks nice, um, but it's only temporary because you're going to have to set those decorations off at some point. Uh, so it's actually about dressing something up, about something being decorated to look good. Um, the idea being that nobody has a plain green Christmas tree in their lounge. You put baubles on it to make it look better. Um, so it plays its part. Um, and an acneresis is an epiphany. And of course, the epiphany is based on Halmer's reaction to Krogstad's letter that he finally gets out of the locked letterbox at the beginning of Act 3 or the middle of Act 3. And um, what she's disappointed with is she she hoped that Halmer would say, we'll get through this together. Don't worry, Nora. We'll get through this together. But that's not what happened because he made it all about him. Um, and in some of the film versions, it actually hits Nora across the face when he finds out about what she's done with this loan. And then when Crosstad forgives the IOU in a second letter, he then starts to talk about the both of them and how they're going to be fine, by which point the damage is done. The straw at that point has already broken the camel's back. And Nora, quite poignantly, goes off stage, takes off her Tarantella costume and puts on a very kind of dark and regular kind of outdoor coat. And again, the clothing showing how her role has changed based on Halmer's reaction. So it was all about him. And what he fails to say and what he fails to realise is that he would be dead if it not be for Nora. She only got this loan to save his life by going to somewhere warm to Italy. Had she not got this loan and broken the law, uh, he would be dead by now. But he doesn't seem to realise that. Um, so he's oblivious to that. So Nora is stuck between a rock and a hard place. She either breaks the law uh, and, is, and is kind of ostracised or or told off by society for that, or she's a dutiful wife and saves his life by whatever means necessary, and yet that's what society is also telling her she should be. So she cannot be a dutiful wife and also get the money. She has to break the law somewhere or go against someone somewhere. So she's in a bit of a catch-22 situation. Butcher means the financial control. Women, for example, could not own their own money, they had to turn it over to their husbands, uh, they could not take out loans, they could not take out mortgages, 
So the male was in charge of the finances. And she lies. She says that she was making Christmas decorations in the attic. In the beginning, she wasn't. She was actually doing some copying work in order to pay back Krogstad's instalments. So she has the ability to keep secrets, which means that she is not the simplistic childlike character we expected to be from the beginning. She actually has inner complexity um, by being able to keep secrets. And that links very nicely to our last point about the macaroons and silk stockings. She's been told by Halma not to eat the macaroons, and yet she does. And then when Dr. Rank comes around in Act 2, she shows her uh, silk stockings above the ankle which is not what the etiquette of the time suggested you do to people other than your husband. So these minor, perhaps more trivial acts of rebellion obviously go on to foreshadow her more substantial rebellion at the end when she decides to leave the house. So all of these points, just some points, though, um, significant revision points that I often find discussing, uh, that I often find myself discussing a lot with students, which perhaps can be used in countless tasks across the political and social protest um, exam when you're talking about the doll's house. So hopefully that has been useful. Thank you.